This is a comprehensive problem that goes over a lot of material that we cover in class. It goes over how to turn a molecular name into a formula, how to calculate the molecular mass of a compound, and then how to figure out moles from that mass, how to figure out pressures from those moles, and then it goes over the concept of partial pressures being additive to create the total pressure. Carbon monoxide is a compound of two nonmetals, so the charges or their relative position in the periodic table is not sufficient to figure out what the molecular formula is. That's why whoever wrote this was uh, careful to write monoxide to indicate that there's one oxygen for every carbon. So the formula is CO. One carbon, one oxygen. For chlorine pentafluoride, there's a similar issue in that chlorine and fluoride are both nonmetals. So again, the name indicates how many fluorines there are for every chloride. So it's ClF5. From here, we need to cl uh, calculate the molecular mass. And we do this by looking at a periodic table that has the atomic masses and then multiplying the number of each element times the mass of each element and then adding up those products. So we're going to look up the atomic mass of, of carbon, the atomic mass of oxygen. We're going to add them up. We're going to look up the atomic mass of chlorine, the atomic mass of fluorine. We're going to add chlorine plus five times the atomic mass of fluorine. So here's the periodic table. Uh, if I look for carbon, I see that like the atomic mass of carbon is 12.01. The atomic mass of oxygen is about 16.00. The atomic mass of chlorine is 35. 4, 5, and the atomic mass of fluorine is about 19.00. I'm using Excel to calculate this, and you can see in, in my formula what I'm doing is I'm just multiplying the mass of carbon times the number of carbons in CO1, and then I'm multiplying the mass of oxygen times the number of oxygens in CO, that's also 1, and I'm getting the sum of those two products, and I get 28.00. Zero. Same thing here, so I'm taking the mass of chlorine, I'm multiplying it by the number of chlorines in ClF5, and I'm taking the number of fluorines and I'm multiplying it times the mass of fluorine as well, and I get 130.44 for the sum. So conceptually what, what I'm doing is I'm taking the mass of the chlorine, the mass of the fluorine, the mass of the second fluorine, the mass of the third fluorine, the mass of the fourth fluorine, the mass of the fifth fluorine, and I'm adding them all together. I use multiplication to get those five fluorines in there all at once. And I get 130.44. Now I'm going to use the following formula to convert moles or to convert mass to moles. So we just calculated the molecular masses for each of the two compounds. And we have, or we were given the masses for each of the two compounds. So I can actually divide mass by molecular mass to give me the number of moles. And if for some reason you can't find this on an exam, what you can do is you can actually use the units to remind yourself what you're supposed to be doing. It's basically just a unit conversion problem. So I guess what I'll do is I'll do one of these one way and one of these the other, other way, and you'll see how it works. So here I am calculating moles of carbon monoxide by dividing the mass, 3.79 moles, by 28.011 grams per mole. And man, I, oh, serious brain fart, sorry about that. It's in grams, right? You guys should catch me on this. Okay, so it's uh, 3.79 grams, it's mass, so it should be in grams or some kind of mass unit, not moles, like by mistake, divided by 28.011 grams per mole. So if you think about how the units work out on this, uh, you end up 
having grams divided by grams per mole. And that's going to end up giving you grams times moles per gram. Remember how if you divide by a fraction, you flip the fraction and then you multiply? That's what I did here. And check this out. The grams cancel and you're left with moles. That's what I wanted. So that makes sense. The units are going to cancel out and that, this is actually the right way to do it. So when I end up finishing this and doing the division using Excel, I end up getting 0.1353 moles from this division. And this should make sense to you because one mole of carbon monoxide will weigh 28.011 grams. And we started off with 3.79 grams. So that's a lot less than 28 grams. We should get a number that's smaller than one, and we do. We get a number that's like a fraction or a decimal. So that makes perfect sense. Um, we can do the same process or the same sort of philosophy, and we can use uh, unit conversions. And what will happen is we'll get a right answer for carbon uh, pentafluoride. And you'll see that the units totally work out exactly the way you think they would. So you do doing this as a unit conversion, what I would do is I would grab the given mass, which is 4.00 grams. And then I'm going to use the formula mass for CLF5 as a conversion factor. So I want to end up getting moles, right? That's what I'm going for here. Yeah, just another way of doing it. So if you look at this, like I start with grams, I want moles. That means I'm going to have to divide by grams somehow in my conversion factor because I want to cancel them out. And I'm going to want to have moles in the top because I want moles at the end. So if I go look at what I calculated, I calculated that the molecular mass of CLF5 is 130.44 grams per mole, but I want moles per gram, so I have to flip it over. I'm going to put that 130.44 on the bottom of the fraction, I'm going to put one on top, and then I'm going to multiply through. So this will take care of the units for me, and I have to do this. So that's 0 0.03. 307 moles. Um, notice that I'm not actually rounding to sig figs yet. That's because I don't want to have any rounding errors, so I'm keeping them out at least one extra sig fig. Actually, I guess I need to have an extra one on this one because I should be going to four sig figs since I need three. 0 0.0306. Okay, so those are the two moles. Uh, that's the moles of CO. And that's the moles of CLCF5. So we could add those up. That would be the total numbers of moles of gas. And then we could divide the each mole number by that total, and that would be the mole number. When I add these two numbers up, I end up getting 0.1659 moles total of gas. This is like the number of molecules bouncing around in the gas, regardless of what they're actually made out of. If I then divide the number of moles of CO by the total number of moles of gas, I get 0.815 something. And I need to actually uh, round that to sig figs. So this is where we start thinking about sig figs pretty heavily. I, uh, that's the mole fraction of each gas. So there's actually like 81.5% of the mole, like the, the particles in the gas, or the moles in the gas, are the CO, and 18.5% of moles in the gas or particles in the gas are ClF5. And looking at this stuff, it appears that I have three sig figs. Um, my Yeah, my number of moles that I calculated came from dividing those masses, which each have six, uh, three sig figs, by 
uh, molecular mass, which had more sig figs. I made sure I had as many digits as I needed and have more. So they're going to have three sig figs total. So if I had to round these two mole fractions, I'd actually end up rounding them to 0 0.815 and 0 0.185. So these are the two mole fractions that we get. Um, more interesting than mole fractions would be partial pressures. And we can get those directly from the moles and the given temperature and volume. And what we'll end up using here is the ideal gas law. So this is the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. And we are asked to find the pressures of each of these gases given the number of moles that we just calculated. And we can do that. First, we'll solve for P. So to solve for P, I need to divide both sides of this equation by V, the, vo the volume. So I'm dividing left and right side by V, and I end up getting P equals NRT over V. And then I can calculate the pressure for each of these gases separately as though they're by themselves. That'll be the partial pressure of each one. N is the number of moles. R is the gas law constant. T is the temperature in Kelvin. And volume is given to us in the problem as 9 liters. I convert from Celsius to Kelvin by adding 273.15 to the Celsius value. So I get 295.25 degrees Kelvin. That's the temperature we're going to use in this equation. And the value for R that I will use, here I am using Wikipedia to find the gas constant. This is the one I'm looking for since we had um, Kelvin and moles and liters. This is a great one to use because I'll be able to end up having all the units cancel except for atmospheres, which is a unit of pressure, which is exactly what I want. So I'm going to copy it. So here's uh, the values I'm end up putting into that formula we just generated. I'm, I made a summary of it in Excel. And uh, what I'm going to do is multiply the number of moles times the gas constant times temperature. And I'm going to divide it by volume. And I end up getting that pressure in atmospheres for CO and that pressure in atmospheres for ClF5. And I guess sort of the interesting thing here that I, I should make a comment on is that we're really treating each of these gases separately as though like they're by themselves. That's kind of the nature of partial pressure and the nature of the ideal gas laws is that we think of each um, gas basically not having any sort of volume whatsoever and basically being independent, being kind of like anonymous, and we're not worried about what the gas actually is. It doesn't seem to affect the ideal gas law. We just think of them all as like little infinitesimally small specks that bounce off the walls of a container, off of each other, and off the walls of a container. So uh, these are the values we get for partial pressures. If I wanted to get the total pressure, I would just add them up. We're limited to three sig figs again. So I would end up rounding this to 0.364. I would end up rounding this to 0 0.0826. And I would end up rounding the total to, uh, I guess, this place, since we added them up. So this, this is like, these are this, let me round these uh, using Excel a little bit. OK, so that's how I would round these two. So when I add these two numbers up to get the total pressure, this tenths, hundredths, thousandths place, where the four is, the thousandths place is the last place that is going to be significant in my total. So I'm going to round to that place. So this last bit required some addition. And that's why I'm going through and making sure that I do, did um, sig figs using addition in places. Um, I should have done this here as well, but it wasn't really necessary because the 
places for these were actually the same, but uh, anyway, um, I can go through and make sure the units are correct just for my own. Uh, so just to reiterate the roundup of all these inputs, volume is volume, usually in liters. Um, N is the number of moles. R is the gas constant. T is temperature in Kelvin. The temperature is always going to be in Kelvin. Always, always, always. So if you have like one of these gas law problems and they give you a temperature and it's in Celsius, the first thing I think you should do, just to make sure you don't make this mistake of, of using another temperature scale, is to convert it into Kelvin. Like, if I wanted to make sure I was getting the highest grade in this course, I would get in the habit of whenever I'm presented with this information and they give me a, a temperature in whatever, make sure it's in Kelvin. Like, that'd be thing number one. This is what people get wrong all the time. This is what I get wrong sometimes, too. I just forget to do it. And I just kind of assume the units will work out. But they won't work out if it's not in Kelvin. Kelvin is a special temperature scale that makes this work. You don't assume that it's in Kelvin. You make sure it's in Kelvin. So in this one, I was given Celsius. So I should go and make sure this is in Kelvin. If they said Kelvin, you're off the hook. Right? <laughs> it's already in Kelvin, you're good. And they said Fahrenheit, you should convert it from Fahrenheit to Kelvin if you have that conversion. And if you don't, convert it to Celsius and then add 273.15 and that will get you to Kelvin. So remember how like I went to Wikipedia and I found that list of all the different gas constants based on different um, units? Remember that? It looked exactly like this. I picked this one. I picked the one with liters and atmospheres and Kelvin and moles in it. And if you look back at how we started this problem and the different units we had, we had moles in N, we had degrees Kelvin in T, and we had liters in volume. And what I did is I selected the one that had liters, atmospheres, divided by moles Kelvin. And what this does is it allows us to actually cancel all the units except for the pressure one, the atmosphere one. So check this out. Uh, I did this right, so I'm really happy to pr uh, brag about it. So um, you, you're dividing by moles in this one, in the one, the units that were given in, in the gas constant. So those cancel out the moles of the moles that we entered in for N. And the degrees Kelvin cancel out as well from the temperature we entered in. And the liters cancel out from the volume. So all we're left with is atmospheres, which is exactly what we wanted. So. Uh, that's how you do this problem. It's pretty long. This is about as complicated as our class will get. I think the only things that rival this in terms of com complexity are probably a couple limiting reagent, sorry, yeah, a couple limiting reagent problems. But that's it. So in terms of steps, this is about as hard as it's going to get, maybe slightly harder.